Okay, nice one. So, uh, before we start with the content of the talk, um, three uh, notes um, on it. So, the first thing is, I don't like to uh, talk about myself that much, but I think it's important to, for what you're going to, to be hearing about next. So, I got interested in security when I was 13 years old, back in 1998, and I started hacking. Um, so, by, yeah, I've done, I started working in my first IT job when I was 16. By the time I was 19, um, I was doing uh, certified Cisco training. Uh, I was a Microsoft C C MTSC trainer as well, and I was giving presentation uh, training as well on Linux system administration. My first full-time um, job in security was as a penetration tester and as a product tester. Uh, I then had about 11 years between uh, security operations and security engineering, and since about 2014 that I've been more focused on governance risk and compliance. Um, what came of that is I wanted to make sure that I wasn't a has-been in terms of my technical abilities, so I've always made sure that I kept up to date with, um, uh, with things. So I do consulting, I lead the security consulting practice lead at Broadlight, um, and even yesterday, uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning, I was um, um, uh, reviewing code with a developer, and in the evening I was doing a risk committee review with a, with a different client. But I like to kind of, I like to do all of the things, I've had all of the roles, um, so that's kind of just to, to base, you're going to hear about some different things today, right? That's why it's called security differently, and that's why I'm providing this, this view. Um, two things, this is going to be like drinking from the fire hose. I'm gonna bombard you with information, but that's by design, right? Uh, what, I'm not gonna give you any answers today. What I want you to get out of here is for you to leave here with a lot of questions, right? And that's what resilience engineering uh, gives us, is a different place to think about things. So that's by design uh, what you're about to experience. Um, and on the second one, I expect there to be two groups of people by the time I finish this talk, right? People that think that uh, this is where the future of security is going, right? Uh, hopefully it will be the majority of you. Um, and the, another part, and I'm sure there are gonna be those in the audience that think I'm, I'm negligent and I shouldn't be anywhere near decision maker, right? So that's what's gonna happen today, just to set expectations. Um, so, in talking about security differently, um, we, I'm gonna talk about resilience engineering and safety science and things that we can learn from it. Now, the first problem with the word resilience is that if you ask 10 people what resilience means, you get anywhere between eight and 20 answers, right? Um, so uh, there's, there was no way that I could give this talk and have a meaningful conversation with yourselves if I didn't find my terms. So kind of the first third of this talk, we're gonna to have to define terms so that when I say a word, you understand exactly what it is that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about. So a problem with the word resilience is that, um, yeah, this is what people are talking about, it, right? It's the ability to prepare and respond and recover, right? Um, this is my personal favorite. I absolutely love this one, right? Best of the tools, plus mature integrations, optimal cyber resilience. I love that one. Uh, but um, basically everyone's kind of defining them in their own terms, right? And that's a challenge because uh, when I speak of the word resilience, you will all understand something that is completely different to what, I'm, what I think I'm telling, what I think, think I'm saying. But, uh, so, and I'm generally concerned because what I really see is people adopting the word resilience, but they're actually talking about the same thing they've been talking for the last 20 years. Right? And I'm gonna explain next why that is a problem. So there's some research, and this is from David Woods. Um, so David Woods is uh, one of the fathers of resilience engineering, uh, him alongside Leifton uh, and alongside um, uh, Holnagel. Uh, and he did this study on how are people using the word resilience, but, uh, which is uh, where we're gonna start. So some people use it as rebound, right? So we, um, something happened, right? Uh, and there's some surprise events that challenge the model. Right? But it's specific disruptions. Right. Uh, I know how to handle a specific disruption. Uh, then there's um, robustness, right, which is the increasing ability to absorb different types of things. So if you've got a, um, a process that is robust, you're always kind of first modeling new things, adapting so that you can respond to the new things that you find out that aren't working well uh, within your system. 
And then there are two other forms of, uh, of using the word resilience, which is more aligned with the actual resilience engineering literature, right? uh, which is graceful extensibility and sustained adaptability. Right? And when I talk about resilience, those are the two that I mean. Right? So graceful extensibility is the opposite of brittleness. Right? So we know that systems have a, a comp in systems, I'm not talking about technical systems, I'm talking about socio-technical systems, right? the combination of us and the machines and the, and the things we do with them. Right? We know they have a competence envelope. Right? There are a certain number of things that we're good at doing that we know how to do them. Right? But when things, uh, how do I extend my capabilities when I get out of that model? So things that I didn't have the ability to, or the time to model well, to understand how, how am I going to respond to them, do I have the ability to respond to them in an, in an effective way? Right? And that's what graceful um, ex uh, extensibility is. And then we have resilience as sustained adaptability, which doesn't look at uh, specifically at the perturbations, the, the thing that you didn't thought was possible that not happened, right? It's about the longer cycle. Is uh, If in five years time, in seven years time, Every time that you have dealt with a model surprise, something that you weren't expecting it would work that way, or did you have the ability to, to adapt to it, right? to change your systems in a way that, that now um, they're part of your competence envelope, or they're now part of things that you know how to do. And these are the four frames um, that uh, people tend to use generally. Now, security vendors, when they talk resilience, as I showed you on, the, on those other slides, those are the things that they mean. Right? But we already had words for that. Uh, we didn't need to use that marketing buzzword to talk about how to rebound and get to a previous state of something that we knew. Right? And it, it, it could not be a problem, but actually it is. Right? Because the value of differing concepts is how much it opens new lines of inquiry. Right? If it's not giving me any new insight and I'm just using a new word because it's a buzzword, then there's no new, new insight I can extract from it. And that's, I think, the, the, if you get anything out of this talk, just an understanding of resilience as something that happens over longer cycles that deal with the model surprises and how we respond to them, right? That's the, the idea of resilience that I'd like you to, uh, to live with here. So specifically on those two, first two, is because if we think of resilience as rebound, then we are just looking at the reactive phases. Right, we're going to see what are the things that we can do to b go back to a previous state, whatever that is. And if we only think of things as robustness, right, um, this frame of robustness, so uh, I don't have a frame to actually understand how, um, how I'm, go I'm going to act when I'm faced with something that I couldn't predict. Right? Uh, that wasn't part of what I threat model, it's not part of my competence envelope. Right? And that's a lost opportunity, uh, even if nothing else. So adopting this frame as resilience in the, the field, the whole field of resilience engineering allows us to, with one focus, which is all of the literature and all of the things that are coming out of that field, it allows us to tap into all of those areas that, uh, that's what resilience engineering kind of converged. Right? We've got cognitive systems engineering, we've got cybernetics, we have safety science, cognitive psychology, complexity, human factors. There's a whole bunch of fields that resilience engineering as a thing draw on drawn on to kind of give us uh, some new types of insights and new ways to think about how we build and, uh, and operate systems. So resilience engineering in the context in which it emerges uh, is, um, as you may remember, NASA had a series of mishaps in the late 90s, right? uh, the Challenger, etc. And that, those were the events that, uh, that led to resilience engineering as a field to, to emerge. And actually the slogan, and that is, uh, I'm sure you can all relate to what happens in your own organizations, is that that's what we are all asked to do every single day. It needs to be faster, it needs to be better, and it needs to be cheaper. Right? And that in and of itself presents some challenges into how a socio-technical system, not just technology, how people respond to the things that happen around us. Right? Um, and this goes into um, some of the theories behind graceful extensibility that I mentioned that we live in on an adaptive universe, right? And there are two basic tenets of this uh, adaptive universe. Change is continuous and resources are finite. Inescapable, right? Those, the, whether it's biological systems, whether it's things that we're building, we're all constrained by these two things. And that has some pretty important implications, right? Uh, not least of which is the, the thing that usually happens when um, uh, a big company gets breached, right? We always get a, 
I like to think it's only a third, but I think it's maybe not more than that, which is some many uh, in InfoSec raise their hands, oh, they don't know what they're doing. Right? No, finite resources, continuous change. It is not possible for anyone, any actor on an organization to keep an accurate mental model of what the, what the system looks like, of how it will behave. Things happen too quickly. They happen in a context that is always changing, while it's getting, probably no one ever thinks that it's the marketing campaign that it's going to put you on a crosshairs of a hacking group that is going to get you breached. Right? But in reality, those are kind of how things emerge, how the, the complexities of the environment, the things that are, that are acting on our context that converge into, into accidents, into many different things. So we've got these uh, tangled and messy layers of stuff. Right? We've got how people deal with each other. We've got the artifact that we used to do security, whether that's a, a spreadsheet that you probably shouldn't be using anymore, or if it's uh, some kind of management system where, where people do some of their work. We've got a new product capabilities being requested by the market. We've got our own internal innovation efforts on how to optimize the things that we're doing because faster, better, cheaper. Right? These are things that are constantly changing and change on an almost daily basis. Right? And that's the world that resilience engineering helps us uh, prepare for. So in order to define terms, uh, I'm going to, um, this is from, um, from Jay Bloom. Uh, you should follow him on Twitter, by the way. Um, I'm going to use these two uh, frames to kind of differentiate between them. Right? There are things that we do uh, for robustness, right? That, that's the risk in design, right? So the things when we have a new project, we do risk analysis, we do threat modeling, we prepare for a number of contingencies of the things that could go wrong with the thing that we're building, and that's how we build a robust system. Right? And opposite to that, or um, different uh, than that, is a, a frame of resilience where we are actually thinking about how risk emerges from operations. Right? How the normal operation and all of these pieces always changing together, how they interact in ways that we probably couldn't predict. And that, so what we're gonna, throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about robustness as the things that we've prepared for, that we believe we can handle, and resilience on how we deal with things that we didn't predict for, that we, maybe we couldn't have predicted for. Right? So, and uh, now we can, kind of start going uh, some definitions and then we go uh, around all of that. And what I'm here to tell you in this, I think this is going to be, uh, I'm gonna refer to this as the big word slide. I'm gonna come back to this uh, a few times during this talk. So what I'm here to, to suggest is that the way we've built our processes, our practices in security, they are largely geared towards a world of dealing with robustness, not with resilience. And they are fundamentally different. Main, largely even at odds, right? And let me, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna go through a few. So the ontology, the, the, the way things are, right? In a robustness frame, it's about systems are decomposable, right? I know I've got these two services, I'm going to figure out how they're gonna interact together, and I'm gonna make some assumptions that that's how they will always operate, right? I'm decomposing systems into their finite bits and figuring out how they do. Um, in, in this world, you were possible to order events. We think that things will follow a certain order, even when experience tells us that may not have been the case. The ontology of resilience is different. Is that we know that in resilience that when sometimes it's the chaos theory, a butterfly here makes a, a, a hurricane over there, right? That change produces an intended consequences. This is just the way it is. Too many moving pieces, finite resources, continuous change, and no actor, no actor can have the full model on their head. Right? It's just not possible. And that socio-technical work is always underspecified. So all of those processes that we write in security and expect that people are always following, they don't. Right? Because that's not how they adapt. We'll come back to that in a different frame, but um, they don't. That's just uh, how it works because no matter how much we try and specify the work that people are doing, it will always be underspecified. And if it's not underspecified, people will not deal with that, uh, will not do the thing according to the process because the, the work of knowledge, knowledge work, has variability in it. Okay? We're not talking about pulling a lever that makes the widgets that we create, right? We're talking about a development process that requires people to talk to each other, to make assumptions about systems that will interact, and what are some of the effects on the line that may happen. So the phenomenology are different. Right? In a frame of robustness, we count the adverse events. Right? 
if we go to your security management systems, you will properly see uh, we've had this amount of incidents, we've had this amount of non-compliances, right? It's always the adverse events that we count, right? In a frame of resilience, we are, we are thinking, we are focusing on our ability to succeed under expected and unexpected conditions. Right? We are adapting to be adaptive. Right? Uh, it's a bit meta, but that's what it is. Uh, the epistemology, so the nature of knowledge is different. Right? In, we always assume that we, kn that we know what we're doing, that experts know exactly, they've thought about it, they know what they're doing. We assume that there's a complete loss of knowledge. In a frame of resilience, we know that our knowledge will always be incomplete, that things will happen in ways that we haven't predicted. That's a natural, um, that's a characteristic of a complex adaptive system. Particularly, the management theories are different. Right? When we think about the goals, the metrics that we want to achieve by the ne next quarter, or at the end of the year from a security point of view, we're thinking more scientific management type of approach. We set these targets, we want that, that metric to be this number, right? and we try to, to bridge the gap. The management theory behind, um, uh, behind resilience is different. It's about the vector theory of change. Right? It's more, I want to go in that direction. I'm not sure if I'm going to get there, but uh, I know that it's, it's that way. Right? Um, in, in your thinking, more from, uh, I want to, if you're doing this properly and actually listening to people, because people are, the, are your source of resilience, not your systems, you, what, what you're doing is you want to hear more stories like that and less stories like this. And that's how you make uh, culture changes and all of that. It's by listening to the narrative. So, one last one, well, two last ones because I'm going to have to talk about ontological alchemy, um, is the interpreter's device. Right? So, when we think about things that go wrong that lead to either incidents or, uh, or breaches, data breaches, we tend to think of our, uh, on counterfactual reasoning. Right? So, what that means is that uh, when we go to do an investigation, we think if they would have followed the procedure, this wouldn't have happened. And that's the end of uh, how much we're going to learn from it. Right? Uh, in a resilience frame, that's not the frame because we know that social technical work is always underspecified. So what we actually uh, have to understand is the contextual dynamics. How are things, how all of these moving pieces that happen at different layers, how are they converging to create the conditions in which accidents or data breaches happen? Right? So this is all kind of uh, in truth, which is the last one, is objective analysis. Right? We always think, oh, I'm going to be objective, I'm going to do the investigation, that person did that, etc. But uh, you know what? Objective analysis is also socially constructed. My objective analysis as a security person will be different from a QA's understanding of, um, of objective analysis. It was always going to be different because the parts on the story that humans focus on has to do with the narratives that they wish to tell. Right? In truth, in resilience, it's about this diverse perspective of narratives. If you haven't explored the narratives of all the different pieces that were involved, the different people that were involved, you're not doing anything to improve your resilience because you're focusing on someone's very usually narrow view of what quality or et cetera looks like. So this is to explain that um, all of these things that we typically do, all of the process, if you go look at the practices and the, the, the way security practices and frameworks, et cetera, are built in organizations, you will probably see that the, fr the underlying frame of them, it's a frame of robustness. Okay? It is not a frame that allows you to explore the different ways that, um, that the world actually works. Right? And be this is all because we're dealing with complex adaptive systems. Right? And we know that in adaptive systems that some things are very small um, that can have large effects. Right? Another thing that people don't tend to associate Maybe that senior director that made everyone's lives hell that joined six months ago, maybe that has something to do with the data breach that's going to happen next year. Right? The problem with that, right, on making people not feel psychologically safe, blah, 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 those things that lead to covert work systems, people not talking about the problems they see, those are all things that contribute to, um, to a bad security culture, to accidents or incidents happening. But those are things you can't put a number against them. Right? And that's the challenge that we have in terms of the, the tools that we typically have to manage security in organizations. They usually require a number, right? Require us to think about uh, some linear causality type model, a threat model, uh, I thought of this, so the mitigation is that one. It's always very linear causality, not so much what actually happens in complex adaptive systems. No. We'll get to back to that at the end. Yeah. 
um, because this is kind of uh, full on. Uh, I'll take any questions at the end. <laughs> so, uh, also another characteristic of complex adaptive systems is that there are model surprises. It will always happen. Everyone is always, they keep on happening. And the best way to think about surprise, this is from a, actually a scientific paper from 1992 from Lamir. Um, that he talks uh, from a Webster thing to talk about the difference between situational and, um, uh, and fundamental surprise. So when they arrived home unexpectedly to find his wife in the arms of his servant, you surprised me, said his wife, and you have astonished me, said Reva. Right? So the wife in this case, she had a situational surprise. She wasn't expecting the husband to be at home at that hour. The husband, he had a fundamental surprise. His whole life changed from that point on, the choices he made, what he thought his life was about, that changed in that particular moment. And this is a characteristic of a complex adaptive systems. This happens in every organization. This happens in, in every big social system. It happens, right? That's the nature of, of the things that we do. So in order for us to be successful in responding to these, we need to become, we have to make these pre preparatory investments, right? So that we are, get used to being surprised, right? So that uh, when we get the new surprise, we are used to dealing with something that we didn't think about, right? And that's a marker of resilience. So the two big things, I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, the two big theories in safety that I've started applying a lot of these are Safety 1 and Safety 2, which is the book by Holnago. Uh, I've got the, those two books that I'm going to reference here. Uh, no one's taking them, but, um, but I have them. Um, so in the, in the Safety Differently, right? And they all, they are very similar theories, um, so I'm, I'm just going to, to refer to both of them. So the safety one, kind of this robustness frame that we've been talking about, which is largely how our security practices have been evolving and how we implement them, it's one that we learn from errors, right? We go about understanding the things that went wrong, the non-compliances that we've had, and we're going to, yeah, let's do some learning to see if they don't happen again. In the frame of safety too, um, we need to learn from our successes, because if we don't understand the, the variability of daily work, how people don't actually follow the processes and how they adapt their work to make sure that uh, we, we are most of the time successful, sometimes fail, but that most of the time that we are successful, we're not learning about this very, where the sources of resilience are and we don't know where our systems are brittle. So uh, uh, learning how to learn from success is something that we need to start doing and we don't have uh, good methods to do so. Not understanding what goes wrong, but what goes right. In safety one, we've got an accident causation model, right? We go back to, oh, it was that person that clicked that button and that other one did that other thing over there, etc. It's all very linear causality uh, type models. Um, in safety two, we, it's about repeating what's right and understanding uh, what were kind of the near misses. There's so much learning to be done in near misses because that's how you see how the teams adapted to a novel situation and were able to get that operating point away from a boundary of failure. And that, that's where a lot of learning could be done if we were to be in the position to amplify what that means. But again, we only focus on the non-compliances and on, on the incidents. So another thing that um, uh, Holnagel calls is the regulator paradox, which is the more we create a robust system, the less we've got to measure. Right? So if we go into, and this is actually something that's been proven in safety science, companies that have a high risk uh, of minor incidents, they tend to have less fatalities. In the companies that have no, almost no incidents, that's where fatalities happen, right? Why? Because if people don't keep the conversation about the risks that are emerging from operations alive, okay? They're measured on having low numbers of incidents so they don't, they, they don't get talked about, right? They get, uh, people pretend they didn't happen. They find out ways that they can use the wording so it's not reported as an incident so it wouldn't hurt the metrics that relate to bonuses, that relate to all of these kind of perverse incentives that we set up in organizations focusing on the wrong stuff. Right? And that's a problem because the less we've got this data to go on, where can the learning come from? If we're only measuring the things that go wrong and the more we get a robust system and we, if we don't experience surprises, that will eventually come. But if we spend a long time without these um, situational fundamental surprises, then where can our learnings come from? The other frame is uh, safety currently versus safety differently uh, from uh, Sidney Becker. So in this, I really like the, the way he poses this, which is in safety currently, people are a problem to control, right? And that's why we all have uh, awareness programs and all of that stuff, right? Which are for really being honest with each other, we're trying to fix the human, right? That's, that's what those programs are there to do. 
He's trying to make sure that the humans don't go over, over stuff, etc. cetera. In, um, in safety differently, we understand that actually people are the solution. People are our source of resilience. The, if they were just, um, yep, uh, given the tools and we were to help them in trying to, to identify how some of these things emerge. In safety currently, we tell people what to do. We create the processes, the procedures, the policies. We check for compliance. We do all of those things that, um, that tell people exactly what it is that should be doing. Do you know many security teams that went out and asked uh, their constituents, uh, what do you need from me to do your things more securely? I know none of them. Well, I do that, but th th that's me, right? Um, so asking people what they need, what do you need in order to do these things more securely, right? There's a lot of uh, domain expertise that we don't have that they do. Maybe that we can, could learn a lot from them than we currently are, generally speaking, as an industry. And again, counting success in safety currently, we count success by the absence of negatives. If we have low non-compliances, if we've got low numbers of incidents, we think, yeah, it's all cool. Um, in safety differently, we have a different focus. We're focusing on the capacities that we have as an organization. When the operating points start drifting, can we bring it back to it? And do our teams have that ability to adapt to the situations that start unfolding and bring it back to, um, to a good operational point? And those are kind of the frames that um, from safety 152 and safety differently that I think are really, really useful in security and that in my opinion are going to, in the next 10 to 40 years, uh, and, and I think I'm being conservative, um, are going to change how we do things uh, as a whole in our industry. So this was kind of the, the language, right, to uh, talk about how the, some of these framings uh, are changing and how very big organizations are doing this a lot in the tech space. Right? So we've got uh, big companies such as um, AWS, Microsoft, Indeed, um, Netflix, et cetera, that are known for some of their kind of resilience, uh, the resilience of their platforms. They all do a lot of these things that you're gonna hear about at the end, et cetera. They've got these different types of frames uh, on how they approach their practices. Now, what I'm going to do next is try to apply some of these, how could we learn in security compliance and risk management and what it, would it look like? if we were to, to do them uh, with these different types of frames. So the first thing is to, to understand this, right? That the person that probably wrote the process probably has never done the job, right? And that's the a problem that we've got in audit and in, in compliance type functions is that uh, most of the time we've got people that didn't, never did the job writing the processes on how it should work, right? That's uh, the problem starts there. And, and then there's this gap that, that always exists and will probably always exist uh, between uh, work as imagined by the gatekeepers, the people like risk managers, compliance managers that are trying to make sure that things don't go wrong, and work as actually done uh, by, um, by, by engineers. Right? The, the example that I usually give is that, um, um, that of your static analysis process. Right? Uh, many organizations, you probably have to have a document that says this is how we do static analysis. Right? You do these things, you get the, that feedback, et cetera. Let me tell you, that does not exist, right? That does not exist in actual practice. It never did and it never will. What actually happens is that a, a developer submits code to their Git repo, they get a bunch of feedback back. It's gonna be unit testing, integration testing, et cetera. In the static analysis part of the feedback process, it's just another piece of feedback that comes from that thing. In the real world, what people are actually doing, what they're touching when the things happen, they do not relate to what your process assumes. Right? It doesn't work that way. Um, so it, it's that difference that um, suddenly, if we reframe into how people are actually doing work and how security fits in, into that workflow, we're no longer in the issue of deploying controls, we're in the issue of attention management. And that's a completely different ballgame. Because you can't do attention management, you can't help them with attention management if you don't understand everything else that is happening at the exact same time that they're getting the security feedback on, on the security things they could be doing differently. And that's a challenge. So compliance has long been on a centralized mode of control, right? So we've got these uh, kind of centralized security teams that try to do policies, procedures, we try to standardize how people do things. So we've got our metrics, so we can compare team A with team B. And usually those are the capacities that compliance teams bring to the table. We analyze hazards and threats, we implement controls, we monitor uh, compliance, conformance, we delegate authority, right? We're very good at that one. Um, it's the, uh, yeah, I call it culpability, but people usually call it accountability, right? 
um, and we kind of try to standardize some of these kind of culture aspects. But what actually happens is, is this. Right? We've got a plan, we created the process. That, uh, so law of fluency is something that Woods um, defined as well, which basically it says that um, well-adapted work kind of uh, doesn't let you see the edges, the, um, the, how people had to adapt to make it work in that particular situation. Right? Uh, for someone outside, it just looks like it's all smooth, like uh, they, they, they're doing what they do every day, but the expert knows that uh, that particular widget had to be done in a slightly different way because, because it had to, right? Because the experts know what's the variability, what's that, um, uh, that variability that is normal as part of knowledge work. So what happens is, when we show all of those policies and processes that do not relate to reality, uh, all of the engineers, they discount it. Right? There's the fluency discount. And what happens is a double bind, right? which on one hand, uh, we have the, the issue of um, people thinking of work as imagined, right? and thinking that they get all of the metrics and that relates to reality. And on the, uh, the other hand, we've got this discount that people, if they can get away with it, they will just ignore it. And usually two things happen, and I'm sure you've seen examples of this in your own organizations. You either get role retreat, where people actually do the thing because they have to, but, but it's soul crushing and they hate it every minute of it. It may lead to churn, it may lead to other types of unhappiness in the workplace. Or you actually get um, covert work systems, right? where uh, people are not doing the thing you expect them to do, but you are none the wiser because you're none the wiser, you don't understand normal work. And that leads to, to brittleness, right? That leads to systems that, are, that have these breaking points that are very rapid, that are cat catastrophic. So in, this is the main thing of it, right? Because when uh, the QA department, when the HR department, when the InfoSec department, and all those departments, uh, kind of from the blunt end, from a governance point of view, they write all of these policies that everyone should know, right? They are leaving it to the to the person at the front line, at the, the, uh, at the digital front line, if we're talking about development, to reconcile all of those irreconcilable goals to still deliver on time and on budget, right? And we leave it to them. And that's why I've got a big problem with awareness, right? <laughs> generally speaking, because it doesn't account for that. It doesn't account that we are putting them in a position that maybe it, there's no way that can they both meet the security objectives and do their work on time and budget if we don't do the work of actually understanding how work actually gets done. So in, in this is, there's an alternative model, right, which is called guided adaptability. Uh, this is recent research from 2019, I think, which is the way we've been doing safety management on centralized control is inherently flawed and unable to cater for the complexity of the work as done. That's just a reality. Socio-technical work will always be underspecified, right, one of the things we, we started talking about. So the role of the security professional is already ch the safety professional is already changing in the safety in the safety industry, and I think that's the change we're going to see in the next uh, 10 to 40 years in, in security, which is we need to be in the position to help guide these ad adaptations as opposed to be uh, checking the book and telling people when they haven't followed the process, and that's a completely different way of looking at the compliance problem. Um, so this is what the uh, mode of guided adaptability uh, uh, contains. Right? So the capacities that the compliance teams would bring into the organization are different. It's about anticipation, creating the foresight so that in, in the continuous re revision of the models of risk. Right? It's this readiness to respond. When something happens, we actually have time for people to join in a session. You don't wait two, hour, two weeks for the security professional to be available. Right? You ensure that you build your security functions in a way that can respond when they're needed. Right, when that extra expertise that people may not have um, require it. And the big one, it's about synchronization. Right? So the coordination of information flow so that information becomes important for decision making. And we're not doing enough of this. Right? We are saying well, people are non-compliant. We're not figuring out what are the, the decisions that are being made across the organization that may ultimately impact security. Right? If Someone had three months uh, on, the, um, uh, on the roadmap to deliver a feature, and suddenly, look, the client really needs this, and it's going to be a month and a half now. Most compliance teams don't have a way to say, look, guys, the, the, I'm sure it's security that's going to suffer. We need to think about what this is. Someone needs to understand what, what are the impacts that's going to happen. Right? But uh, if it's not an incident or non-compliance, we're probably not even going to be there. It's just a business thing. Right? And I think that's where the compliance teams need to, to evolve to is to help organizations surface 
this whole conflict, this synchronization between what's happening in different parts of the organization so they can support decision making. And the proactive learning. So what this leads is if we've got a, this fluency, when the policies and the plans don't get discounted because they're actually feasible, and the uh, people doing the work understand that, uh, yeah, this is something that uh, is part of my work and I know how to do, it leads to a revision, not a discount, right? We've got this open line of communication where we're always adapting the, our processes, our policies, to reflect the things, that, how they're actually done. Right? And there's the keeping pace, right? A, a big problem in security teams is the unaligned tempos of governance, right? Where you may need a couple of weeks or a month or two until the next meeting or whatever to talk about a particular, a particular problem. This kind of, the keeping pace is also important. So, Last thing about compliance on things that we can learn from, um, from resilience engineering. This is from the original book, um, so uh, Concepts and Presets, which is already from 2006, uh, where David Woods talked about the four eyes of what a, a future safety um, management function would look like that I think translates really well to, to security as well. So the four eyes are involved, right? People need to be involved in daily decision making. Now, the first problem there is that if you don't have the right skill sets in the same language as the people that you want to do, they won't want you in the room, right? It's that simple. Anyone doing compliance in, in risk work, I'm sure they have come across that, right? If we're not speaking the same language, they don't want us in the room. That's, it's that simple. Um, it needs to be informed, right? So understanding what are the pressures that are being applied to work, what are the conditions that people have to work and how they can affect. Um, and lead us into incidents or, or, or breaches. It needs to be informative, right? So generate, helping the teams generate the operational information that can lead to decision making. So we can say, okay, we understood that these are the different things happening in the organization. We're gonna kind of get the operational information to bring it to a decision maker saying, we are seeing the conditions for risk to emerge from these different conflicting things that we're all trying to do. Uh, and it needs to be independent, right? A, a voice that can um, kind of call forth to power and all of that stuff. I absolutely love the, this, the, this quote that uh, Woods um, put there, and I'm going to, to, to read it. Uh, I don't like to read from slides generally, but I think this one is worth it. So if compliance teams are going to, uh, to survive in this new world where we understand complexity and how uh, things actually work, compliance functions need to be more than an arm's length tabulator do more than compile a trail of paperwork, being more than a cheerleader for past success, right? So not having incidents for X amount of time. And I actually had this on, um, on an interview that I did. Um, so I was interviewing for a client, someone in the, in the crypto space, and someone told me that they were really proud that their crypto company wasn't hacked in one and a half years. And, and, and I must wonder, was that luck? Was that, um, was that skill? Was that luck? No one knows, right? Um, it's a really weird thing. And it needs to be more than a cost center that sometimes slows down work. Right? If compliance teams are going to move into this new world where we understand complexity and implications and that what we write on policies and procedures may not relate to work as it's actually done, we need to evolve to something along these lines. So that was my take on compliance. Now let's look at risk management. So risk management as imagined looks something like this, right? If you have uh, ISO 31000 or 2705, this is something that you have seen. Right, it's really, it's really neat. Con context, identification, analysis, evaluation, treatment, you monitor, review, looks really cool, doesn't it? The, the problem with how we apply this type of technique is that usually that's what we're doing. Right? We're designing, we're trying to, in the designing always involves matching an object that doesn't exist to a context that cannot be completely specified. Right? So it will always have gaps. If I give you three hours to threat model, if I give you 10 hours to threat model, there are still going to be things that are going to be missed, right? That's just the nature of things. Finite resources, continuous change, right? So how risk management is actually done looks more like this, right? So accepted industry best practices, we're all taking the same courses, we're all learning from the same books, we're all be doing the same thing for the past 20 to 30 years, even if we say we're, we're not. So those lead to some training in ingrained patterns on how, what a risk manager sees, what a compliance person sees in terms of the thing that they expect to see. Right? So, and because their conception of work is one of work as imagined, right? When we go to do that risk analysis process, if we're being tr truthful, that's what happens, right? We go into our control stop hat and we say, you 
that function, you get this control and that control, you get that one, and we distribute controls and we hold them accountable when they, they're not working. Right? Which is, after you achieve a level of robustness, and robustness is important, I probably should have said this earlier, right? You should not be thinking about resilience until we've created robust systems, right? Because you've got, you need to deal with your robustness first, right? What I'm talking about here is how can you evolve from some of the downsides of uh, how some, some of these things work. So the thing is, there's a whole socio-technical system in organizations that deal with risk. It's frankly myopic thinking that uh, the, who manages risk in the organization are the risk managers. Because everyone in the organization, every stakeholder, every actor, they are uh, simultaneously dealing with goals, priorities, functions, processes, configurations, and all of them are trying to optimize for their local requirements because they're what they're measured on, right? That's just how things work. So it makes it real, and because we've got this complex network of interdependencies, it gets really difficult to see how uh, changes will reverberate across the, the organization or across the systems that, that we manage. Right? And so two concepts here are the concept of uh, local rationality, right? How did it make sense at the time? Right? And you will always get a very good answer if you ask this question. Right? If you just ask, why didn't you follow the procedure? That's a bad question. Right? You're framing the response in your question. You're not going to get anything useful from asking that question. Right? But if you, how did it make sense at the time? Then you understand what are the goals, the, the priorities they were trying to reconcile. Right? And the other thing that we know about is from naturalistic decision making. The research from Klein in the 80s. Right? This is all stuff, this is from 1997, this way of thinking about risk. Right? We're not talking about new things. That's why I, when I said 10 to 40 years, that, that's what I mean. Right? Um, so, and the other thing is satisfying, right? where experts don't tend to analyze 20 or 30 different ways of doing things and choose for one. They've got their own expert heuristics. They bring it down to one or two things or three that may happen, and they think, okay, this one will probably be the one that gets me to meet more of the things that I, that I need to care about, the different goals that I'm trying to reconcile. Right? That's how experts uh, you know, this, uh, make decisions. That's what we know from co uh, cognitive sciences. So a different way to look at risk, instead of trying to break down all of those components and see this interaction using stride, right, in that type of threat modeling type approach where we think about the, the uh, interactions between components, it, this is a, a functional abstraction approach, right, where instead of thinking about how you are decomposing systems and uh, thinking about the controls that you're going to add, you think about an operating point, right. Your operating point will be this thing in the, this white space in the middle. And we know that the variability of work is, all of this is variability of work where things just keep on ticking, right? There are no problems here. Things keep on ticking, it's working, it's all good. That's what the white space um, means. Then we have a boundary of an acceptable workload, right? If we push people towards a, a boundary of an acceptable workload, if we give them a, a lot of security processes, a lot of different things that they need to, to do on top, uh, we give a development team five um, uh, code bases that have five different languages, right? Uh, so we're giving them a workload that is going to be uh, approximate, uh, make them close to this boundary, right? Where it's going to start affecting how people are, are behaving, how they're, how they're responding. We also have a boundary of economic failure, right? Where things go over um, uh, time, budget, all of those types of things. And finally, we have a boundary of, ex of incidents, uh, of accidents, right? Where when things go over the boundary, we know we are on a, um, we've had an, inc an incident that we're dealing with. Now, the thing here is that there's this error margin, right? And what that's meant to, uh, to illustrate is that where we think the boundaries are, are not usually where the boundaries are, right? All of those policies that we have that say this is where the boundary is, that's usually way far away from where, where, where breaches and security incidents actually happen. And that's a problem, because we also know from all of the research from high reliability organizations in the 80s and 90s that there are organizations that operate closer to these points of boundaries, they are much safer institutions. Right? Because there's no fat that faster, better, cheaper is going to eat into. Right? Because we put our policies so far away from, from, from a place of where incidents would actually happen, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice because it's, they're gonna be discounted, people will ignore them, and they're gonna be moving towards the boundary of uh, uh, where accidents happen and in incidents, um, bec just because of the normal pressure, faster, better, cheaper. Right? 
So when we create and are very specific on what the, those boundaries are, we actually allow different parts of the organization to have a shared mental model of where that boundary should be. And if, when everyone agrees on where that boundary is, it's much more likely that we we're always going to keep the operating point on the inside of that line, right? The problem mainly happens when different people in the organization have these different models, and then there's reconciliations that should be happening and are not happening. So I'm gonna go very quickly through this, but I applied this model to security. Um, so in terms of an acceptable workload, this is usually about uh, getting consumable security capabilities. So instead of telling people you need to do this, we actually give them, look, here's a library that you can use that it's gonna do it for you. Here's um, a, a script that you can run. Here's, um, you can go to this repo and copy this Docker command, it's gonna give you the same grep uh, audit, right? It's making things consumable, easy for people to, to do, so they don't need to go this unacceptable workload boundary. And it's also, instead of thinking about security processes themselves, we need to think about the operational practices and how can we influence people to, so that those operational practices actually assure your security objectives. So the example that I usually do and that I always try to do with my clients is, I don't want to create the security process of uh, the, the things that you do for security. Let's work together on your definitions of ready and definitions of done. That's your thing. Let's try and affect what those are, what those mean, how, how, how you, because that's work has done, right? Those are, those are the things that the product owner will get at the end of the sprint. Did we do these things? Can we move on, right? And that's leveraging the practices that already exist as opposed to living in the world of fantasy of some documents that don't actually relate to anything that people do. Right? So using a commoditized security solutions, doing more on the, the economic boundary. So thinking about consuming cloud native capabilities or the unaligned tempo um, uh, of the governance oversight. Right? We are companies that deploy code even five times a day uh, or companies that will do thousand or 10,000 times a day, they can't wait for a security compliance person to be a, to, to wait three weeks for uh, the enterprise review board to say if they're gonna go ahead with something or not, right? We need to change how we are c building security teams so that the, 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 the advice, the expertise is available when it is required. And that's about realigning the, the governance tempos to ensure that we support that. Now, the thing with, with these marginal boundaries is that we have this normalization of deviance. Right. That um, is basically what that is, that's uh, research coming from Challenger by Diane Vaughn, uh, which um, realized that uh, in NASA there was this, um, people thought they were in one place, but uh, there started being a drift uh, from what they thought was, um, uh, was the expected practice. Right. And this normalization of deviance, usually the, the example that I do, that I tend to use is, we've got a code base, developers, they see seven critical vulnerabilities. Right. We didn't get breached. Three months afterwards, we've got 70. Another three months, we've got 700. Still, we weren't breached. Does that metric mean something to them? What should they be learning about that? If it keeps getting worse and worse and nothing happens, is it something that they should be worried about? But maybe it is, right? But um, it's this, the, the, this, this normalization of um, getting things to, to a place where maybe it's not very healthy, uh, that ends up kind of normalizing the way we do things around here. Maybe we don't need to care about that. And so unrealistic policies set the tone for these types of things to do, right? Because if we're just bombarding everyone with, um, so a, a typical example that I see a lot in organizations is we implement a security control that always gives you a report on everything that happened, uh, on everything that's wrong from a static analysis point of view, on a code base that is seven years old, right? They're gonna see 150 things to fix every time they submit code they are not going to be paying attention, or if they do today, they won't be in three months because faster, better, cheaper, right? So what would the, the thing to, to realize is, for instance, uh, Sam Grep and some other tools, they are now getting into uh, the possibility of do, doing base reference. So instead of looking at the whole code base, it looks at what's been, uh, at the difference between the last commit and what you're doing now, right? That contextualizes the security feedback. And it's much more likely that at least we're not making it worse and then as security managers, we can think, okay, we need to go get a program of work to fix all of the legacy stuff and let's prioritize them, et cetera. But I've now integrated the control into a workflow in a way that actually has a chance for people to do something about it. Because if I'm just giving them seven, 700 warnings uh, two times a day because that's how often they deploy code um, that the security stuff is wrong, 
they are not going to pay attention because they can't. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be delivering on the, the things they're measured on if they did. And that's how we eventually get drifted into failure. So having pragmatic policies that uh, do this thing between efficiency and thoroughness, having the work system designed to alert when it's close to the boundaries, but boundaries that are actually uh, feasible, right? That make operational sense. And having awareness but focused on practical skills that relate to the work being done, right? It's all well and good to have kind of awareness stuff for fishing things. That's something that, uh, that everyone does. But when it relates to the work practices of a developer, that doesn't give them anything that's useful when they log in the morning and start writing code. Right? We need to think about what awareness means in the context of normal work, and most awareness programs aren't doing that. So if we th think about this, this way of thinking about how risk emerges from operations and how this operating point is always dynamic, it's always changing, then what we really need to be resilient is having skills to cope at the boundaries. Right? That when we're getting close to some of those boundaries, that we have ways to identify that that is so, and that then teams know what to do to bring it back to an operating point that is a bit further away uh, from that. And how do we do that? We've got the practices for it. We've got chaos engineering, we've got security chaos engineering, we have game days, um, Facebook calls it storm drills, uh, but it's uh, essentially the same, uh, the same concept. Uh, or if we don't have any of those and we are not in the position to do any of those, be creative. One of the things that I, that I suggest usually is do disaster recovery, right? Uh, as you tend to do on a yearly basis or whatever may be the case, but work with the engineering manager to say, look, let's build one or two scenarios that only the two of us will know what the scenario will be, right? And let's see how the team handles uh, an, uh, something that they're not expecting, right? A new thing that we didn't do the, the preparations for, right? That's how you build in the, the, the habituation of people getting used to dealing with surprises, right? So you, I don't know if you read it, but the last Facebook outage where uh, there were people locked outside, uh, they had to yeah, catch things, etc. That's amazing for a number of different reasons that most people didn't, I think, probably didn't pay attention to. They have, they have one of the biggest distributed systems on the planet completely down. For six hours, they couldn't reach anything. In 30 minutes later, they had the big, one of the biggest distributed systems on the planet back up and running. That's absolutely impressive. I, I can't even imagine how good those engineers are into all of those. And if you go, even if you go read the, the report that the engineering team did on this, they specifically called that out. If we hadn't been doing storm drills for how long as we, we've done, we wouldn't have recovered the, our system this fast. We just wouldn't. They wouldn't be used to being surprised, right? And that's what resilience is about. So in terms of how we approach risk management, we, the, the strategies that we're doing are, um, this is also from the same paper from Rasmussen, it's the empirical strategy, right? It's, uh, we think these controls, we've got these problems that we thought about, we can implement these simple controls to, to fix them, right? We are creating a new S3 bucket, we encrypt it. We've got a, a, a new system putting out. We only open the firewalls to uh, receive traffic on the, the ports that we're expecting, right? It's those kinds of things that are kind of more simple in nature. And I think that's largely a solved problem. Some people do this not very well, but I think in the industry overall, I think it's a solved problem. What is not a solved problem, particularly in security, are the other two strategies that we also need, which the first one is an evolutionary strategy. So it's understanding how past events and understand how different parts of the socio-technical system interacted in ways that created these surprises, that created something that we, that we can learn from. Right? And we, in security, we don't have methods for this. I don't think we should. We'll get back to, to that in a minute. And we also don't have an analytical strategy, right? which is the language of complexity, understanding how things that we do. So every developer that I know that has been working for more than three or four years, they've always seen something along these lines. You make a change to your code base today, and you feel an impact three months down the line. Right? That's complexity. Right? That's a natural part of building complex systems. Right? That's not, they should have done a better job at la la la. Right? This is about, that's the nature of the thing, right? Faster, better, cheaper, pressures, we need to deliver, right? It's always gonna be happening. So, and this is about understanding that complexity of how things uh, kind of evolve. So, we're getting to the, to the final part, and this is where I'm going to make it practical uh, for all of you. I'm gonna talk about some, some things that are already being done in safety sciences to try and bridge this gap uh, between the, the different things. So, the first one is learning teams. 
So you've got URLs below. I would suggest everyone to do it. If you want to decrease the, the gap between this um, work as imagined and work as done, as I talked about, this is a way to do it. Right? Because this is basically a way to bring pe people together in the room. There's a, a real good structure on how you approach um, the voting team process. So these are the principles. We understand that work as imagined and work as done uh, give context. Both are important, right? Work as imagined and the things we do for work as imagined they serve assurance purposes, right? We need them. We can't just rip it off. Yeah, it's not going to happen. They serve a purpose. What we need to understand is that they give context to what happens in terms of the organizational dynamics, right? And this is a process to try and explore that. We also know that groups outperform individuals in problem sol identification and problem solving, right? Bringing different people together, exploring the different narratives. That's where we've got, uh, we identify ourselves with resilience. And this is something that we tend not to think too much in security, which actually the workers have the best knowledge and understanding of the problem. Right? We're trying to make things more secure for, for the organization, but they understand their work better than us. They always will because they're the ones doing it. Right? So we, this is a way to tap into that knowledge and make things that are mutually beneficial. We need to understand better the problem. We go way too fast usually into this is the problem, this is the control from OWASP or whatever that you need to implement to, to fix it. Right? We go too fast from problem identification to problem solving, generally speaking, without understanding the context, without understanding how things will actually get done. Um, yeah, in this, is this idea of soak time. So one of the things that you do in learning teams is you have a session for problem identification. You do not talk about solutions. You, talk, you identify the problem. You spend an hour, two hours, you just talk about identifying the problem. You all go back to your desks, you come back, um, Day later, two days later, everyone had time to think about the problem. Now you start talking about uh, about the solutions, right? And just this gap between how fast we go from problem identification to problem solving leads to completely different quality on conversations. Right? So this is a technique that is uh, starting to get uh, very used in the, in the safety science, and I would suggest everyone to look into because we can learn a lot from it for security. The other part is learning from incidents, right? So when incidents happen, how do we uh, approach the learning? Now. You're all gonna tell me, Mario, I'm already doing that. Let me be very clear, you are not, right? Not with the frame of resilience, right? Because the way we've built, uh, the, if you go to any type of standard, this is not the type of thing that you're, do, that you're doing. So the, at the moment, the gold standard for, uh, for learning from incidents from the, the engineering community is HALI, the post-incident guide by a company, uh, jelly.io, right? Um, so I would suggest everyone to go look into that, how they structure, how they um, set up the meetings, the types of narratives they explore, how they gather feedback. So there's a whole process around that. What was the gold standard before how we came along was the ETSI deb uh, debrief facilitation guide. And I would still suggest that you go look into that because that teaches you how to ask good questions. Generally speaking in security, we don't know how to ask good questions because we, kn we, we know what should have happened. So we try and uh, ask questions that, uh, that get us into that frame. So in Howie, I've got an example here. This is an example, right? So if someone tells you, for instance, uh, I knew that I had to get it fixed before I le left work for the day, right? This is a way to try and explore that, right? So how did you know? Did this happen in the past, right? Have you seen other people stay late to fix those similar issues, right? And suddenly, you're not just tapping at the, the thing that someone did that brought the system down. You're really trying to understand what are the goal conflicts and the pressures that they were under that led to that event. Right? And that's a much better place to be from a learning point of view. And that's the thing. What you are probably currently doing in terms of learning from security incidents and all of that leaves, leads you, uh, leaves you in the adaptations field. Right? It's the objective analysis. Right? We go into the, okay, someone did this, that then led to that, and then that other person did that, and we did this, and this is where we are. It's our objective analysis. The thing is, that's not how complex systems work, right? And if you really want to, to learn organizationally and make, and make things better, we need to go further back from that. What were the conflicts they were trying to reconcile, right? And what were the pressures that led to those conflicts, right? And this is, I think, the next step uh, for, for, for risk management, which is not this linear causality model where we're thinking of these scenarios and what controls we can put in place. It's Actually, let's see how the things that happen in the organization create the conditions in which these other things happen. Right? 
in the, again, the systemic contributor analysis diagram is something from the safety science. This was actually released about nine months ago or a year ago. So this is very, these last few things that I'm showing you is very recent uh, research that's been doing in the safety science field. In the final, so this is not the usual um, um, depiction of uh, system dynamic maps, but this is a tool from systems thinking. Uh, and this is something that, um, that I've used with a client uh, uh, before. This is an actual, a real example uh, that I've used with a client. So the concern that they had was, um, uh, I was hearing the CTO say something along the lines of, uh, people aren't innovating. I tell them that they've got two hours every week to, to do training on their own, and no one does any training. I, I, what, what else can I do? Right? So I kind of drew a picture to try and explain what the problem is. So the problem to me was very clear. We had a product strategy and um, a, product, a new pro head of product that was very good in terms of knowing what the market needs for the next three to five years. Uh, and that was going into product prioritization that was taking all of the oxygen in the room on the backlog. Right. So all of these innovation efforts, so at first they had kind of this thing, decision making forum, that uh, uh, engineers were encouraged to bring in new things for, to consider so that they could be added to the roadmap. Uh, but then, uh, Things were very slow, and the developers themselves decided to create this other thing, a proposals process, um, to get initial feedback before it went to DMF. Right? So if someone wanted to do something innovative, they first had to convince these people, then they had to convince these people, and then eventually it would go into, onto a backlog. Right? Um, and on the issue of uh, time, right, they were saying, I told them they've got two hours, why aren't they using those two hours? Well. Uh, because the, we were expecting that this wasn't taking all of the oxygen in the room. They had story points to deliver. The product owners had committed to a number of things. There was no time that was considered that um, I can't do those many story points in this week because people are going to, to do something about it. So my suggestion was, look, until you start making these things visible at the backlog level or something along those lines, that's potentially a way to deal with that. But what I am telling you is that these are the contextual dynamics that explain why you're not seeing what you think you should be seeing, right? So this is another way of thinking about context, right? Instead of thinking of, again, linear causality models, we go and analyze, explore narratives, right? I talked with people to try and understand what these things were, et cetera, and I built this visualization of what are the contextual dynamics that are leading um, to these types of outcomes. In the last one, so another thing that came on in the in safety science lately is um, the safety clutter, the idea of safety clutter. And I've adapted it uh, because I think we have a lot of that in our organizations, generally speaking. So security clutter is the accumulation and persistence of security rules, procedures, and practices that do not contribute to the security of work. Right? And here, I think it's important to distinguish between security of work and work of security. Right? There's a difference. Right? And we, we security professionals tend not to look at that difference. We think of uh, the work of security as the things that we do to secure stuff. We're not thinking about how it's actually the operational practices that are, people are doing that need to be made secure because that's where work is actually being done. That's the value chain, right? We are probably not part of that value chain in that way. We're not building the software that is going to bring revenue, right? We uh, are kind of something that happens, uh, that hopefully happens alongside us. So in order to do this, you need to explore these three dimensions, right? And these are really good conversations to have um, if, um, yeah, if, the com if the risk and compliance team are happy to have those conversations, which is, what is the contribution? We've got this security rule, so to which extent does this have actual value, right? Well, do, do we get any security value out of doing this thing, right? That's the first place to start. Then it's the confidence, right? So are we certain, whether through evidence or belief, Right? We've got a lot of belief and a lot of folk models in security, um, which is judgment is made. Right? Is it based on something we can point to? Can we say, yeah, this rule exists and gives us this thing? What, how confident are we that uh, that's actually a, a useful rule? And then the consensus, right? the level of agreement across different stakeholder groups on how much that is actually contributing. Right? And if we've got explored these things on some of, uh, of our security policies, I would suggest pick up one of your, whatever security policy you have, and go try and have a conversation going through that document saying, is this clutter, does this actually work, et cetera. I assure you, you're probably gonna learn more about your organization in that one hour where you're having a conversation along these lines than you probably did in the last two years. So, and this is to finish. 
companies that are succeeding in the marketplace are generally applying these resilience engineering approaches. Largely, I only know of one company, and I should name it, that is actually bringing a lot of these things already into their security teams. Right? So this, even the companies that are adopting resilience engineering practices, it's usually happening kind of outside of security. Security are still doing their thing, as they've always done, and we've got these kind of new uh, engineering practices that are, that are emerging. The companies that are doing this well, they're being quite successful. Right? Everything seems to indicate that this is the future of how uh, people do uh, in software engineering. Right? Uh, it may not be a problem, it may never be a problem. As I said, I think it's gonna be between 10 and 40 years until this, um, this is going to be kind of common practice. That's how long the paradigm shifts typically take. Now, if your competition isn't starting to think differently, maybe you don't need to, you can discount everything you've heard me say for the last hour, maybe it doesn't apply to you, maybe you don't need to do things differently because it doesn't make a difference because in your industry, everyone else is doing the exact same thing. But at some point, it's gonna become a strategic disadvantage. At some point, you will see that the skills that you require to be successful aren't there because people are doing work in ways that are, are not congruent to modern software development. And uh, you don't have to change, survival is not mandatory, right? But uh, I would suggest that if moving forward, if we really want to integrate into the security of work and not the work of security, right? which is if you look at team topologies and other types of approaches, that's what we're moving to, right? And in a real enabling mode, not the enabler we've been using for the past 30 years, actually being an enabling team, provision, providers of capability, not requirement setters, right? That's uh, how I tend to frame the, the shift that needs to, to happen in the industry. Um, maybe it's not gonna be a problem, at some point it will. So I think until we get to a point where our skills are no longer required in the market, I would suggest everyone to start reading about this stuff. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Drinking um, from the fire hose, I think I delivered on what I promised. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, that's so full of um, information there. And, and Mary has actually said he's going to let the slides, uh, let's have a copy of the slides. Yep. Right? Yeah, so um, you can digest that information at your own leisure. Um, at any time, but we'll make those slides available to all of you. That was a, a very interesting talk. There's certainly lots of stuff for us to go away and think about there. Um, <laughs> so th th this is uh, something that's really down my street um, that uh, I've really enjoyed. So thank you, Mario. Thank you. Uh, for a great talk. Does anyone have any questions for Mario? Well, it was one earlier, just repeated. Yeah. How do you translate this into uh, making steps across the pipeline resilient? Um, you don't, right? quite frankly. Right? Um, so th th that's looking at what you do from a, t from a technical point of view. You are increasing, you, when you start implementing something in CI/CD, you already have an expectation of the things that you're going to do. So the framing will largely be one of robustness. Because if you need to codify something, it means that you need to understand what the output is going to look like, otherwise you can't codify it. Right? So the, the learning, where the learnings come from is around the, these longer term adap adaptive cycles where you take the learnings that you get from talking with the teams to influence how you are codifying things. Right? So they eventually get translated, but it's not a direct thing, if you understand what I mean. Right? This is more about the, the human, the, the learning, the, the human learning that, that comes and then influences what we do in CICD. They can um, translate in um, changing uh, how the output is, is given, yeah, right? Changing, yep. Yep. Like your pipeline, like there must be some plugging over things, you know, in your pipeline. Yep. You know, change the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's exactly the thing that I that I didn't want to do here on purpose, right? Because I think there are uh, people like Aaron Reinhardt, Dennis Cruz, etc. They are applying a lot of these ideas from resilience engineering, but to the specific use case of um, uh, of, uh, of CI/CD, etc. Right. What I don't see people doing yet is trying to apply these ideas on how we manage our management systems. So I'm not gonna do a better talk than Dennis or Aaron in the areas of case engineering, I wouldn't even try. But I think these, these ideas also have value to how we manage uh, governance, risk, and compliance, and that's kind of, uh, that's my lane. <laughs> I'm gonna stay on my lane. <laughs>
Storm drill. Storm drill. So I think there are two main challenges there. Uh, the first one is the, the issue of path dependence, which is also characteristic for complex adaptive systems. So the simplest way to think about it, if I go into an organization where um, the, the security person has been the, the guy, that, the, or the girl that's been around with the book, are you following my procedure across the, across the board, you are not gonna have that affordance, period. Right? Because the, the, the way that people will internalize what security is, is someone that is checking on your shoulder and trying to, to check, um, the checklist. Right? The first thing to do for security teams is really to to get someone that that speaks the same language as the engineers. Right? That when you build the report for them to actually listen, and you f for you to even have the the ability to influence their definitions of ready, their definitions of done. Right? If you're the person with the with the book and you say, I want to change your definition of done, and I've seen that happen, they will go, No, that's my process. You deal with yours. Right? You're not coming. That's my thing. That's not yours. Right? So in order to even have the ability to have that conversation, you need, uh, you need someone with the right profile and that has, um, doesn't have that path dependence on the organization of uh, what it is that security does around here. Right? So that, is, that would be kind of my main point. Do you need more trust when working in a resilient way more than a robust way? Oh, of course. Because if of course. trust is not there, you're always going to say that. So yep. that. Again, tr building trust starts with language. If we're not talking the same language, you're not going to trust me. So that's why, particularly for B2B SaaS organizations, one of the, 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 the patterns that I usually suggest is create a product security team right? that acts as this kind of intermediation between uh, the people that are kind of eating the books, right? <laughs> governance, risk, and compliance, and the people that actually have the engineering. And so the, the governance, risk, and compliance teams can influence uh, the types of ch uh, automated compliance check that go into CICD, right? But when it's the, the product security team talking to engineers, speaking the same language, they can see, okay, what's the best way that we can work together to make this work for them, right? And you don't get uh, someone with completely out of context say, you now need to do this thing because my book says so, right? That's the thing that does not generate trust. <laughs> so, uh, coding not so much. I do some uh, Terraform stuff sometimes, uh, but, uh, but not kind of uh, develop. So, I ne was never a software developer itself. My background is infrastructure. So, that's why Terraform and all of that type of stuff. Um, my spare time, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm always busted. I, I can hardly walk these days. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that's about it, usually. When, um, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and security is usually where I spend my time. And the kids. Uh, so, between those three. <laughs> Um, I, think, I think it's a bit of a combination of, of, of all of that. So, again, going back to one of my last comments, I think it's the difference between, the difference between being requirement setters and capability providers. Right? When we are focusing on, uh, on providing capability that makes it easy for people to consume security, right, we get the benefit that they don't actually need to be as experts um, on the thing to, to actually understand what, what is required of them. And that's where the, 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 the principles in team topologies, for instance, come in really handy in terms of enabling teams and all of that, which is in order, and that's a problem that we've got in security, which is uh, we're very quick to say security is everyone's job, but we're usually not very good to understand what that actually means in the, in the context of their work. Right? And, and I think that's kind of the, 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 the big difference, is understanding that we can provide capability, right? So to make it easy so they don't have to have all of that cognitive load. So we're not going to make everyone a security expert. That's just 
They already code two or three languages. Their uh, frameworks are changing every few months, expecting them to be experts in everything security that relates to their product. It just doesn't make sense. Right? So if you make it easy by giving them capabilities to consume, we nurture those capabilities as platform teams are currently doing, right? In 2020, so I'm from the, I started my engineering days where as, as someone in infrastructure, I had an app developer come to me and say, look, I'm gonna need you to build a system for me to deploy this app. The answer would be, and this is what everyone was doing, right? Was, okay, you can wait three months because I get some servers rack um, in three weeks and then I need to put the network and I need to do the things that you're gonna wait, right? These days, platform, good platform teams, they give you templates for the developers to use, right? They optimize for the value chain. And that's the, 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 the change that um, I'd like to see more of, is uh, security functions actually having product owners that treat their security capabilities like platform teams are, uh, are building the, the platform capabilities. Well, that already happens. I think it doesn't happen more often because usually these companies that work at scale have the need to present SOC 2 type 2 reports, that type of stuff that makes it inevitable right, that, um, that, that things they do. But the way it constrains how they build systems are, are real. Right? Um, so I was talking with an engineer from one of, the, of, of those companies uh, um, um, just last week, and that's what, what she was telling me. Right? Whether that, uh, they work in a completely different pace. It's, um, the things don't make sense. So. An example of rules that sometimes don't make sense. They've got this system internally that uh, people usually tend to access one or two times a year, and the password recover and the passwords have a three-month validity period. So the two times that uh, that team needs to use that system, they always need to wait them five weeks because they need to go to uh, the no one knows where who manages the thing, and then they need to request for the password reset. And it's always they, they spend two days of their life on just because of that system, right? It's that type of thing that um. It's small when you're thinking about one system, but when we consider that maybe the company has 150 or 200, this is actually a business bottleneck, right? And just it makes the, the experience of security be a bad one. Okay. So that, you only influence that if you're involved from, uh, from the start. Right? And that's where, uh, again, thinking in terms of the capability that the business needs. Right? The capability that the business needs is actually a QA process that validates that those um, steps are being followed. Right? So patterns that work, there are many patterns that work. Right? Some companies have a QA team that um, uh, create those tests and they may augment them with the metadata so that we know it relates to ASVS. 8.4.2, yeah. right? And we both get the benefit from a compliance and risk point of view, and all, but they also get the integrated the process. There are teams where you've got a security engineering or a policy team that is creating uh, OPA, chef in spec, those types of things that integrate into the pipeline. Uh, again, it comes down to the capability and how you can replicate them uh, uh, across a number, of, uh, a number of different teams. If you can have that, um, if many different teams use a type of login process that you can have 
one QA team build a test that you can then use across all of the pipelines, that's how you get the benefits of scale, right? But it's, that I think goes always back to organizational design, right? Are we making the, those needs uh, identified and um, allowing for, um, for the process to integrate that type of feedback? So it doesn't need to be an afterthought in the de tech debt that you need to deal with later. And if it's immediately a feedback that, um, that someone uh, gets when they first submit code, it's gonna be dealt with then and there, right? It doesn't need to go into the next sprint. It doesn't need to be come up on a vulnerability assessment or on a, on a gap analysis, right? You know that it's done then and there. So it's this gap on getting to a point where a lot of the, the security, ASVS compliance, that type of thing, gets codified in a way that is reusable across different teams. So that's the business capability. Yeah. 